And please open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning a new letter, and we're just moving right along from 1 Corinthians last week and the farewells. Now we have greetings in, in 2 Corinthians, and uh, we're not going to try to belabor that too much, but uh, I want to encourage you with, uh, with this passage. I think it's a great passage just to encourage us to look to the Lord. Blessed be the God of comfort. You ever send a, a wrong text? Oh, now I know some of you aren't quite in the texting realm yet, but uh, they say that texting crosses, texting pretty well goes to every generation. I mean, kids and adults and grandparents and, and no matter what. And uh, I find that I do, I do a lot of ministry texting. I mean, I was keeping up with uh, Linda's condition here regularly. Uh, I got a couple of texts this morning from Kurt, just uh, kind of giving me the updates on what's going on. And, and I know I've had that from others of you as we've, you know, I'm asking about how you're doing, what's going on. And, and sometimes we can go back and check. But I bet if I went through my record of texts here, text, in fact, uh, I don't remember who sent me a text even, was it today or yesterday? And then, then they sent one word correction. I do that all the time. I send a one word correction, either my fumbling fingers or my spell checker takes over and uh, sends something that is unrelated or whether, you know, and they, I think it must be that the phones remember words that you use often or something and they're, they stick them in there. And anyway, it's kind of frustrating sometimes, kind of embarrassing sometimes. You may have heard of the guy who uh, sent this love text to his wife. I've heard of this in real. I've heard some jokes, but he sent this love and he hit send and he realized, oh, I sent that to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we won't, we, and so, I mean, we, we all can fumble and do something wrong and, you know, something goes wrong and those kind of things. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul had no texting ability, no availability of that in his day. But it almost seems like this letter, if, if you look at the history of this letter, that there can be, there can be a, it's kind of a change of heart. And it, it almost looks like maybe he's, he's uh, wanting to maybe take back some words that he wrote in some letters that we don't even have. It's there. There's, there's a good indication in this context of, of this letter that there was another letter that we don't even possess that, we, that was lost somewhere. That doesn't mean we've lost scripture and that we should be looking for scripture elsewhere. Don't get that idea. But there's, there's, there's possible, possibility of even two letters that may have been written back and forth that Paul wrote back to these guys trying to correct and help or whatever. And uh, it almost sounds like some hints we get in this letter that maybe what he sent before might have been a little too harsh. And he wished he could untext. He wished he could take it back a little bit and, uh, and get a restart. But whatever the case, God has seen, seen that we are given two letters to the Corinthians, first and second Corinthians. These are the letters that God has given for us. And uh, so we are going to see what God has to say. And, and uh, there's, some, there's some highlights in this letter uh, of second Corinthians that, uh, that you would remember uh, if we would point them out. But there's a, there's a lot of very personal things. And it seems like sometimes you know, it's not just one letter, it's kind of a whole series or a whole thought that the Apostle's trying to get across. So sometimes we're going to have to cover some bigger ground or larger context in order to get the sense of what the Apostle is talking about. But, but we have God's Word before us and we're going to look at it in a verse-by-verse -verse manner and, and uh, see what God has. Uh, as we as we look at the background of this letter, the apostle probably wrote this about a year and a half after, uh, after he wrote 1 Corinthians. So if he wrote another letter in between, or two letters in between, we know that he was busy. And we know he was busy in the city of Ephesus and, and that kind of thing. And then it seems this letter, though, was written when he was on the move, maybe up from, from Macedonia. Maybe he got a report as he went north up to Macedonia. And maybe he got a report on, on what was going on. And uh, he wanted to send something back. 
And uh, the apostle mentions, mentions last year two different times in chapters 9 and 10. He talks about, well, last year, last year, there was some communication. And so uh, 18 months would fit. Yeah, it could fit within, you know, when someone says last year, it would fit in the idea. And so let's look at the context and let's read. Let's read the first four verses that we're going to look at this morning. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints who are in Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And I know I'm stopping in the middle of a paragraph there, but we're, gonna, we're just going to cover that much this morning. And, uh, and of course, when we look at the first couple of verses, we see the greeting that the Apostle Paul gives. And it's a common greeting that he, you know, you can almost pick this out of anywhere. There's a few little, uh, little things that are a little bit different, but of course he starts with his name. And being I mentioned that this is kind of a personal book, uh, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 briefly. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and uh, just look at a couple of verses there where Paul shares his personal testimony. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, because on the personal side of the Apostle Paul's life, as, you, as we learn about who he was and what he was doing, he was, on, he was a, a man, a religious man, but he was against Christ. He was a religious man against Christ before the Lord intervened in his life. And, and so to get his personal side of things, and I'm not going to go, we could look at three different chapters in the book of Acts to see his testimony of how it all happened. But I want to get you the big picture in verse 15. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul says he was the number one sinner. And when you look back at his life and the, what the, his persecution of Christians through the book of Acts, we can say, wow, that's what that means. He was a persecutor. He was against Christ all the way. But he, So he says he was chief. Then he says in verse 16, However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first... So, the, and by the way, the word first and the word chief, depending on your translation, they're the same Greek word. Paul was the number one sinner, and he's the number one example. That in me first, that in me also, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul says there's no one should be able to say, oh, I'm too bad. I'm too bad of a sinner to be saved. No one should be able to say that. He says, I was the number one. I was just in the face of Christ. I was against Christ all the way along. And then number two, he said, and I'm a pattern of what it means to be saved by God's mercy and grace. He was the pattern of what it, you know, and that's what he says. And in both of these verses, uh, notice in verse, in verse 15, he says, uh, the, the first thing he points out, Christ came to the world to save sinners. Have you, ever, have you ever run across people that have said, well, Jesus came to be this example for us? Yes, that's true. But that's not the whole point. I remember someone, someone uh, emphasizing around, around uh, the resurrection day, around Easter, and they were saying, they were uh, arguing for the fact, well, Jesus came to show us how to die. You know, they're missing the point. They're missing the point. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's the message we need to have today. Yes, he lived a perfect life, Etc. And that was essential. That was essential for him to live the perfect life, to be the perfect sacrifice. 
but He came to save sinners. That was His point in coming. It wasn't to teach us new things or whatever. He came to save sinners. And Paul put himself out there as being the, the number one, the number one sinner. And then he, he points out that he received mercy. And the reason he received mercy, mercy is, is not getting what you deserve. As the chief of sinner, chief of sinners, he should have been sent straight to the pit of hell. But God gave mercy, and he had a design for Paul's life to say, wow, look at that guy. He was the worst sinner, and God saved him, then surely God could save me. And the, the point is, is that it comes back, it comes back to the gospel. You know, dozens, last week, last week as we shared the gospel at the festival, dozens, in fact, uh, more than one person, more than one person that told me from here, told me that they talked to a lot of church people. They talked to a lot of church people and a lot of church people were not clear on what the gospel was. And I think part of it is, is a lot of church people don't hear what the gospel is. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, in verse 3, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. What Paul's getting at right here, Christ came to save sinners. How did he do it? By just by showing us, teaching us things and showing us things and dying and... No. He died on that cross for our sins. He died on that cross for our sins in our place. And that's, that's the emphasis of the, of the gospel. That Christ died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And I wonder about... I wonder about if you never hear the gospel... And, and uh, I don't mean to be picky or pointing anybody out, but I, I wonder if some of these people that were answering questions to me and they really, they really couldn't get the gospel out, I wonder if they can't verbalize the gospel. I wonder if they really believe the gospel or are they really trusting their own religion? You know, well, why should God, well, I was baptized as well. Or why should, well, I went to, I go to church every, you know, I go to this church and I do that and I do this. Is it about you or is it about Christ? Do we have an awesome Savior or do we have a religion? And so our focus is on, the focus of Paul in his testimony is the gospel. And we're, we're naturally prone, I think, to to make works and religions and the, the litmus test of what, what it means to get to heaven. Two, two teens I talked to, uh, both of them said that God should let them into heaven because of their goodness. Because of their goodness. Is that the gospel? No. It's Christ. And it's Christ alone. And we all have to come like Paul, throwing ourselves on the mercy of God because we're all sinners. Romans chapter 3, there's none good, no, not one. Not one. Not one of us are good. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and, God, and we're in that position. God puts us in that position so we turn to Him and trust Him. And it's a matter of faith and trust. And again, uh, I, I sat on the chair, and we had those little chairs in that, in that tent there, and I lifted my feet off the ground till my stomach hurt. You know, showing what trust really means. Pick your feet up, put your faith in the chair. Oh, it's the same way. That's what believing in the Lord Jesus Christ means. It's trusting that Jesus Christ died for you. So I pray that you, I pray that we get to the heart of the gospel and especially as we think about what the Apostle Paul, who the Apostle Paul was. He was the chief of sinners that God showed mercy so that he's the pattern of pattern of what it means to be saved today today then I ran across an article and it said something like this it said you will never mature or grow in the Lord if you are not secure in your foundation i.e. the gospel you'll never mature you'll never grow in the Lord so it's sad it's sad to hear 
religious kids talk about everything else and not the gospel and not Christ. Christ ought to be our focus. And the gospel ought to be the center of, of where that focus is. So why did Christ come? He came to save sinners like me. That's what we ought to be able to say. Anyway, also, coming, you can come back to 2 Corinthians with me. As we think about the Apostle Paul, notice what he, he says in this verse. He says he's an apostle by the will of God. And so not only was Paul, not only was Paul the, the pattern for salvation, he's also the apostle, the apostle for grace. He's the apostle of grace. And uh, as, we, as, as we just look at that, he, he's saying, my apostleship was arranged by the will of God. He says that same thing as he began the first letter to the Corinthians. And he says similar things in other books where he is somewhat defending his apostleship. Evidently, I think the Corinthians were still lacking or else they were hearing another another uh, message from somewhere else that was downplaying the Apostle Paul's ministry and how important the Apostle Paul's ministry was. And so Paul says, it's the will of God, people. God may be his apostle by the will of God. I'm not one of the 12. He never claims to be one of the 12. He claims to be the unique apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11:13. 13. He claims to have special revelation from God. And so when he says he's an, when he when he says this introduction, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, it is God's work in Paul's life that made him made him this apostle. It just it wasn't just God's work that saved him, but God gave him this special position and special apostleship as well. To keep, so keep that in mind. So we ought to have the gospel in front of us. We ought to have and and Paul's example. And we ought to have Paul's apostleship in front of us. Those things are foundational and will encourage us to know where to look and what to, what to find. So Paul's the, pattern, Paul's the pattern for salvation, the Christian life. And, uh, you know, he's, he, he recommends, he says, we ought to be following those who follow, who follow like Paul followed. Philippians chapter 3 says, yeah, you don't have, we don't have Paul around today, but he says, follow others who are like me, Philippians 3.17. Timothy's one of those guys. So he says, this letter is from Paul, it's from Timothy. Timothy was, Timothy was uh, he, he notes him here as a brother, but as a young man, he was recommended by his church. Recommended by the church to go with the Apostle Paul. That's in Acts chapter 16. And... Uh, and something that Paul told uh, the Philippians about Timothy in uh, chapter 2 of Philippians, uh, chapter, chapter 2, verses 19 to 23, Paul told them, here's a guy that has my mind. He has the same thinking that I have. And he has selfless care. He will selflessly care for you. So Paul put him up as an example and he said, here's, the, here's this guy, this guy Timothy, who, who is Christ-like, Paul-like, and, and someone who is very caring. And so as he talks to the Corinthians about him, Timothy was right with Paul as Paul traveled through Corinth. And so they would know Timothy. And so Timothy is there with him, sending this letter along. This letter is sent to the church. The word church, easy idea for the word church. It's those that are called out to gather together. Called out. And uh, there's some depth beyond that, but basically it's believers, believers in Christ, people who know the gospel, and uh, it's without distinction of race. It's without distinction of, of uh, position, <coughs> popularity, gender. There's no distinction. We're one in Christ. We saw that strong emphasis in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we are one in Christ. And in this context, the focus is on the church at Corinth. You know, he could have written the church at Tip City. He could have written that kind of an idea. That's, it's the focus on the church in Corinth. Uh, we had the privilege of being in Corinth a couple of years ago and, and uh, we, we saw the isthmus that made Corinth the city that it was. 
and it's that it's that little if you look at the map the little narrow narrow portion there between the two seas I had to change the color a little bit I apologize for that but to get the rest of the wording but but uh, the the two seas it's a small a small isthmus about four miles across and uh, today there's actually a canal through there but when they built the canal it's now too small for the bigger ships to go through but it's pretty fascinating to we stood on a bridge over that canal and just looking both ways to sea to sea and and uh, it's just kind of a fascinating place and then Corinth then Corinth uh, actually in this one Corinth is to your left and and kind of some of that lighter area but uh, in the city of Corinth it was a hustling it was a busy hub business and commerce and and uh, one of the key things I for, forgot to mention again, but that isthmus was, uh, was what made Corinth because they would, instead of sending ships all the way around, they could send cargo across that four miles. And in fact, if the ship was light enough or small enough, they actually moved the ships across that four miles. They would move them over land. And uh, there's ideas and things and pictures of how they did that, but, uh, and it would save, it would save days at sea where they could move things across in short order uh, that way. So it was a really a quite a hub, and and we stood uh, we stood just above the where the harbor came in, and there was fresh water, and there was just a lot of things going on. But a lot of a lot that was going on was wicked as well, a lot of immorality in the in that city, and a lot of uh, it was known for that. And I I ran across a quote just the other day that said. To be called a Corinthian lass was to impugn the, a woman's moral character. So you didn't want to be called a Corinthian lass because they were just known for immorality. And a lot of that tied right in with religion. That's just astounding to me. You know, but religion without God, without, without the scriptural basis, religion is going to degenerate. And it degenerated into immorality and temple prostitutes and all sorts of things like that. Achaia. He mentions Achaia. And uh, that's the re region surrounding Corinth. That, and that's at least in the first century, that's what it was. And so one of the, just, I want to just, just point out that evidently this letter was to go beyond the city. It was evidently to go beyond the city and to reach the region or the around. And then we have Paul's common greeting, grace and peace. You know, salvation is by grace. Peace is the result. Are they yours? For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, listening to which it boasts. That's the salvation message, by grace. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Those are ours. We have literal peace with God if our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as Paul mentions grace and peace, uh, it's not just a trite saying. He, he has a point to making those, to saying those things. And then he addresses, blessed be the God of all comfort. You know, that idea of blessed, I mentioned as we read that earlier, I mentioned the idea of, of uh, worship, and I do want to draw your attention to the idea that, that Paul's point here is right away, he draws our attention to the Lord. He does the same in, Philipp in uh, Ephesians 1.3. You know, he talks, blessed be the God who blessed us with all spiritual blessings. But he kind of moves away into what we get out of it. But here, his focus, these guys needed their attention to be drawn to God. You know... Why are we here today? I hope it is worship. And where's worship supposed to go? To God. And we ought to be thinking, and I appreciate some of those songs that we've sung, and we've had that focus of worship this morning. Our attention ought to be to God. And, and, and in this case, Paul is pointing to, pointing to the idea of worship. And I want to, I wanna, he says, he calls God here the God of all comfort. Anybody have a, this is called a, this might be called a comforter by some, right? Anybody want to borrow it? Is it kind of cool out there? You know, you, you know, this is a comforter. Well, 
you know, is kind of lax when you compare the idea that God is a God of all comfort. I mean, sure, on a cold night, sit in front of the fire, cozy up with a book and read it, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, this, this, is a, this is a comfort, but it's not the God of all comfort. The, a blanket is never going to give you all comfort. This is quite a bold statement that he's making here, talking about the God of all comfort. And uh, it's quite a, quite a statement that he's making. It takes it, you know, he, he's taking us to the idea of real, genuine comfort. So let's, let me back up. The word blessed is where we get our word eulogy, if you look at the Greek word. But it's the idea of a good word. And, and Paul launches into this, and I'll just say simply that, you know, it's always good. It's always good to praise God for who he is and what he's done and what he will do. It's, it's always a good thing to do. But I, I think there's way more behind this. And, you know, in, the, in this context, skip down and take a peek at verses 8 and 9 briefly. Notice what he says. For we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. In this context, the Apostle Paul is, is talking about, I've experienced trouble. See, there's that personal idea. I've experienced trouble. But he, so maybe that's why he is mentioning here right away in, in verse 3 that the Father of our Lord, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort. He just wants us to know that God can be a comfort. And I put together three reasons here for you why Paul may have begun this letter like this. Number one is worship. It's always good to worship God. Number two, persecution, verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9, and, and uh, let me just add, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. All who desire to live godly in Christ as Jesus shall suffer persecution. Persecution isn't that far away. If, uh, there, are, there are, in countries that we think are free today, we think of Australia as being a free country. I just read a note, there are certain pastors that have been arrested in Australia for preaching the word that homosexuality is sin. You know, we think of those, uh, that as a free country. We know Canada has had some problems. U.S. pastors are getting flack. I put a neat article on the board from... Uh, Ken Ham, uh, that you ought to read. You can't miss it. It's the ark in full color. I'll leave it at that. You go read it. But no, not now. All right. <laughs> anyway, but number three, number three, I think there's an expl explanation in these verses why Paul didn't get to Corinth right away. You know, they, I think Paul intended and they expected Paul to get back to Corinth sooner than he did. And this might be somewhat of an explanation about that. He talks about God as the Father of mercies, uh, Father, of, Father of Christ and the Father of mercies, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, we, we mentioned already that, that Christ came to save sinners. Well, we know from Galatians chapter 4 that God sent him. We, we, and if we compare 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, he was sent to be our Savior. The everlasting Father had an everlasting Son who came to die in our place. You know, it's a celebration of the gospel. As he says, he's the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the Father of mercies. What did Paul say in 1 First Timothy 1.15, it was because of mercy. He's the pattern of what it means to be saved by God's mercy. And then he mentions this God of all comfort. And the word comfort, you've heard me say it many a time. The word comfort is from the word call beside. And, it, I, and it, you've heard me say it at funerals where there's the, uh, the sense that it's the sense of God's embrace maybe. That God is calling us to his side. God is reaching out to us. God is the God of all comfort. This word also means encouragement. It also has the idea of encouragement and uh, exhortation. And in a sense, 
In a sense, what he's saying here is that God is the one who has all we need when we're in need of comfort. The God of all comfort. In other words, there's nothing lacking. He possesses everything that we need in our time, in our time of need. He says, in every tribulation, he uses the word tribulation. It's the word for the seven-year tribulation, but the word has the idea of pressure. It has the idea of being pressed and, and feeling it. Anybody have, I think we might call it stress today, that we're feeling a little stressed. You know, and I know sometimes that ebbs and flows and work gets terrible or relationships get difficult or whatever it is, but sometimes we feel the stress, don't we? It's like some, something closing in on us, like, like we're just feeling the, we're feeling, feeling the pressure of not enough hours in the day. How about you? Have any, have any stresses? Any pains? Any sorrow? Any sickness, sadness lately? We'd probably all have to raise our hand, wouldn't we? You know, it's just, life, life is not easy. And being a Christian is not easy. And God doesn't say that, oh, have your cupcake and eat it too. <laughs> God doesn't tell us to. God doesn't tell us that just because you've trusted Christ and you're, and you're, you're saved, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that life never, life never happens. We have difficulties. But what we do have in this context is that God of all comfort is the, he is the one to whom we are to turn. He's the one to whom we are to turn. And in verse 4, and in verse 4, he says, part of the reason is, is that we're to comfort others. That we are to comfort others with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. I don't know if you've ever experienced, you know, comfort, God's comfort. But if you have, there's a, it's a twofold purpose. Yes, it's to, for you to receive comfort. But it's also for you to use that. For you to use that to encourage others. In other words, like we've been saying as we, you know, in, in various passages, if, if we look back to Ephesians 4, we are involved in the ministry. Comfort may be a part of our ministry. So I want to just talk briefly. We've been having a great class in our Bible study, and a lot of this goes right hand in glove with that in the last couple of three weeks about suffering. But let me just share a little. Let's just think about suffering opportunities that we face. Notice I put that together. Suffer, opportunity. Hmm. That's what this verse is about. We have suffering opportunities. So, you know, as, as we look at the back of our bulletin, it's loaded, isn't it? The back of our bulletin is loaded with people who have sickness and, and difficulties and sorrow and death. I mean, we're faced with that. We're faced with that every Sunday. We're faced with that every Sunday. But the answer is the God of all comfort. It's not some magical prayer. It's not just having your name on the list. But there is... God is the God of all comfort. And sometimes we fall into the same category that the unbeliever falls into. Have you ever, have you ever thought, oh, what did I do wrong that God didn't heal my friend? Why am I going through this? Is it me? You know, unbelievers... That's, that's where the unbeliever is. They're looking to blame God. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, oh, I'm giving away a big one, aren't I? This is a, this is a favorite. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you have Paul three times. He's probably facing illness. It's probably something. He says it's a thorn in the flesh. But three times he brought it to the Lord, and then he said, all right, 
I got the message. Your grace is sufficient for me. It's not, it's not, whoo, wow, we're healed here. Come to a healing service. That's not the point. The point is, we have a God who is faithful, who is true, who, hits, who can cover every single need that we have. even though it may not be as we wish. God promised grace. So why do we have sickness? Why do we have troubles? Why do bad things happen to good people? One word, sin. Oh, they're big sinners? No. We're all sinners, remember? Just like the chief of sinners. You go back to Adam and Eve. When Adam fell, God promised all sorts of, all sorts of evil upon, upon humankind. Toil, troubles, stresses, evil, wickedness, all sorts of stuff. Because of Adam and Eve's fall. It's not God's fault that evil persists. You know, it's interesting in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy 3.13, Paul says, in the last days, evil men are going to get worse and worse. Anybody ever think things are getting a little worse? Don't we? We all say it. Maybe every generation since Paul has said that. But evil men are going to wax worse and worse. That's God's promise. Where are we going to turn? To the God of all comfort. Take comfort that absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Romans chapter 8. You know, when I lost my grandparents, I kept thinking, wow, if only, if only we'd have had another few more years. And then it dawned on me, man, they'd have been way over a hundred by now. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, we kind of have these wishful, oh, what do we really want? Don't we really want that relationship with the Lord? Don't we really want that God of all comfort? Don't we really want God's peace within and God to work within us? The scriptures are full of comfort, encouragement, challenges. Let me, take, let me give you one other tack here. Ever have financial troubles? Ever cause your own financial troubles? <laughs> we have, haven't we? Oh God, please help! I, I can imagine God, hey dummy. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I mean... A lot, but a lot of times, a lot of times we bring it on ourselves, don't we? You know, can God be a comfort even though we're the dummy? Yes. Yes, He can. He can be a comfort even in those times. But a lot of times we need to take His encouragement and listen to what, listen to God's plan and get our house in order in other ways. Blessed be the God of all comfort. I, I just love the way that Paul immediately brings us, points us to God. It points us to the one that was, and so no matter what we're facing, he's the answer for all his people. Paul knew it personally. And he wanted the Corinthians to really know it. I pray today that you have placed your trust in the Father of mercies. And if you have, I pray too that you've entrusted your life with all its struggles to the God of all comfort. He is the one to whom we are to turn. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this assurance in the beginning of this book that it brings us and points us to you, that you are God.
and that you have something of comfort for your people. May we truly believe that and trust you in Christ's wonderful name. Amen.